more or less hand and order. Let me get going on some of these uh, negativities and some of these striking contradictions that we are experiencing in the world of work. Now, firstly, this rising individualization and precariousness of work across the world. More and more people are left on zero hour contracts or in the gig economy or short term contracts, very fluid rights, but also they're left with, you know, to bear the brunt of the market, so to speak. They are the ones who have to shoulder the, uh, the fluctuations in supply and demand or the demand for their labor. Yet we are experiencing that they have no rights. They are stripped of many workers are stripped of any social and fundamental rights. So they are left in an enormous income insecurity, not knowing whether they can pay their bills from month to month. We also, this, this mismatch between the social systems and the current labor market is all too evident. For example, in the yes vote to Prop 22 in California. You know, this third category of worker that is now being introduced, it has been in place in the UK for many, many years. It hasn't worked there, and it certainly won't work in the United States either. Now, work is work. My assumption is that no matter how that work is conducted, under what contractual or non-contractual form, all workers should enjoy the same social and fundamental rights. But then again, as I said, who is this worker? Who are the workers? Now, even in a room full of workers, and I ask the floor, who in this room is a worker? I seldom get more than 70% of the hands up. So this is one of the tricks that we've been dealt is to believe that we are something different than a worker. And this is probably a big explanation to the decline in trade unionism. Why should I go together and collectivize with others when you know, I've been told I'm something special and something more. Well, the fact is we are seldom stronger than the weakest link. And this whole perception of us being different from a worker, I think has a lot to play, but also has the, the highly unacceptable union busting. Employers are spending millions every single year on busting unions. Now, for me, this should be forbidden. Any indirect or direct union busting it has no place in our modern societies. So if we look at the futures of work, now there's pluralists there deliberately. There will not just be one future of work. There will be futures of work as we experience them differently from wherever we are in the world, according to the jobs that are available, the skills that we have. One of the things the employers seem to agree with the workers on is the necessary re and upskilling that will have to take place. If you look at the rhetoric around the world, they all sort of latch on to the re and upskilling as if the future of work could be solved through that. But they never mention who's going to pay. Now, how are we going to combine this increasing individualization and precariousness of work with this lack of funding for re and upskilling? Can we expect an Uber driver to take two or three weeks with no income to go on a re and upskilling course? No, of course we can't. So when the employers talk about re and upskilling, my answer is, are you going to pay? They also somehow believe that digital technologies are given. You know, that the rest of us, you know, we have to react to the technology that is coming, that the technology is somehow superior to us as humans. Now, this technological solutionism, so to speak, is very, very dangerous. We hear it in the talk of, oh, the robots are coming, as if it's a civilization greater than ours who's going to come and control us. Well, again, you know, we are not powerless here, but the rhetoric somehow is dubbing us into a belief that, that we can't really do anything. Yet my claim is that it is precisely these technologies that we should govern and frame. They're not necessarily born evil, but they're not necessarily born good either. And if we want the world that we are seen to be creating in all of these AI principles and ethical AI thoughts, well, then we're going to have to govern these technologies so they serve people and planet. And not just some people, but the majority, if not all people. 
And then this links into the whole discussion of automation, the job losses, you know, the fears and how Frey and Osborne's study has been you know, grossly sort of uh, misrepresented, to be honest. But 50% of all jobs are going to disappear and, you know, we're going to have devastating impacts on the world of work. Well, yes, if we continue down this current trajectory of doing nothing, well, then we very might well might see, as Wendell was saying, this hollowing out of the middle uh, level jobs, middle income jobs, and the polarization of the workforce. This might very well happen, but again, it's not a given. You know, we could be demanding of companies when they invest in disruptive technologies that they also are obliged to invest in their people, in their re and upskilling, in their career paths. But many companies, and we've seen this during the COVID crisis, are investing heavily in autonomous systems, semi-autonomous systems, in the hunt for productivity and efficiency. Our markets, as they are structured right now, call for this quarterly shotgun capitalism of proof of earnings increasing all the time. But I want to question this and really ask, are we producing ourselves to hell? If we look at our climate, if we look at the devastating impact this overproduction has had, is productivity and efficiency, are they the goals that we should be striving for? Is it time that we move, as many are calling for, beyond GDP as a measure of success? Imagine what our economies, what our policies, what our markets could look like if we committed to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Now, across the world, we are seeing rising inequalities and we need to address these inequalities. Inequalities between genders, between identities, between ethnicities, between race. Now, all of the research has shown that unless we really learn to govern the digital technologies, the algorithms, the data sets, the bias and discrimination inherent in these systems are only going to accentuate the inequalities that we already experience. From predictive policing to the calculation of welfare benefit uh, dues to automated hiring systems, again and again we see in the juridical system inequalities and bias being shaped. Now, at the same time, we seem to believe that these systems are efficient. Well, of course, they're not, and many, many scholars, many practitioners are flagging this, but it's a call again for the regulation and the framing of these systems. Autonomous tools, they need governing. In the world of work, I would hate to experience, which I think we already are in many ways, that a worker who's looking for a new job will not see certain jobs online in the job announcements because that person a priori and by an algorithm has been deemed unfit for that job. We must never have an algorithmic tool, an opaque system, which we don't even know exists, determining our life and our career opportunities. The same in the autonomous hiring systems, who gets hired, who gets fired, on what data is, are these tools built? Do they match if an autonomous decision-making system designed in the United States is deployed in Kenya? Is it matched to the Kenyan culture, to the institutions of Kenya? I doubt it. So we cannot turn a blind eye to this discrimination that's potentially happening. And many of us who work in this, you know, we look at the social credit system in China and we kind of shudder and go, oh, that's too much. But Again, I want to provoke a little bit here and say, don't we already have that in our parts of the world, in the developed world, but it's not run by an authoritarian state, but by numerous private companies known as well as unknown. And before I sort of end my, my rant here on some of the negativities and some of the things we have to be careful of, I really want to stress that no biological social system has functioned on homogeneity. We need diversity. We need to really work together to ensure that our labor markets are diverse and inclusive. Yet at the moment we're segregating, we're undervaluing and we're underpaying the work of many of our peers. 
So with COVID, with this skyrocketing demand of surveillance and monitoring software, with the rising awareness that we are being turned into objects, into numerous data points that are being used to make influences on us. What will your next move be? Is she likely to vote to the left or to the right? Then we also have to understand that contrary to what the ILO decided in 1944, that labor is not a commodity, we are becoming commodified. We are becoming objects that are fed into these systems regardless of who we really are. We must never, never accept that this is the case. Then we will lose our autonomy. We will lose our democracies. And I can really only echo Susanna Supov's call that we urgently must ban markets in human futures. We simply cannot accept that these influences are going to shape our work and our career and our life opportunities. Mm -hmm.